Welcome to those of you who are joining us for today's at home COVID test accessibility webinar. We are getting started here. And my name is Katie Frederick. I am the digital content manager for um, Vision Aware. And that is with the um, Connect Center at the American Printing House for the Blind. And again, want to welcome everyone to our um, webinar this afternoon. And I see that one of our panelists has joined on the phone. So let me see. Um, I won't be able to promote you, um, Dan. I believe that's you, but um, we will certainly let you speak, um, introduce yourself and speak um, throughout. So with that, um, again, welcome to today's at home COVID test accessibility webinar. Just a few housekeeping um, things to go over here. Uh, we will be using the chat features. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to drop it in the chat and make sure you change the two to everyone so that um, we can all see your uh, questions and comments. And we will take those if there's time at the end. Um, but we have a pretty, pretty packed panel and session here today, but really um, going to touch on an important topic. So with that, um, first things first, I'm going to Pause the recording. With that, um, I would like to have the panelists introduce themselves today. And again, we have a robust uh, panel with us um, this afternoon. So um, why don't we start um, with Alan? Would you like to go first, please? Sure. There we go. Hi, uh, I'm Alan Lovell. I am the Information and Referral Services Coordinator for the APH Connect Center. Um, and so we, our role is to answer questions with regards to visual impairment, uh, low vision and blindness. And um, we have, uh, as you will learn in this webinar, uh, partnered with the Elder Care Locator Services and this COVID home test, um, we share information back and forth to make sure that the people who need assistance with this test can get it. Uh, thanks for joining us. Helps when the host unmutes herself. Um, Allery, would you like to go next, please? Yes, hi, good afternoon. I'm Valerie Yingling. Legal Program Coordinator with the National Federation of the Blind. I've been with the NFB for 10 years. Among other things, I'm a first point of contact for our members when they experience discrimination. And this has led to my involvement in our efforts to ensure access to COVID-19 tests, vaccines, and information. Um, I also monitor NFB's settlement agreements, help de develop self-advocacy resources, and help coordinate with our external counsel. Thank you very much. Zach. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zach Trammell. I am the program manager at US Aging for the Elder Care Locator and the Disability Information and Access Line, which I'll be sharing um, a lot with you um, today about. All right. And on the attendee side, um, we have one of our panelists, um, Dan Spoon who um hello katie hi hi great to have you would you uh yeah <laughs> uh this is dan spoon president of the american council of the blind and i've been very involved with a listening committee that meets once a month with the radx team that is helping to develop uh additional accessibility for the home um COVID test kits. So working with that team, which is associated with uh, NIBIB, which is a uh, institute inside of the National Institutes of Health. Great, Dan, and we'll come back to you for some comments later on in the presentation. Um, so you can, um, you're at the 
we'll just make sure that you are unmuted for that as well. So. Thank you. All right. Um, so again, as we're talking about the accessibility of at-home um, COVID tests, we reached out to, to Zach um, with his connections with the U.S. Aging Network and invited him to come and speak with us today about the, the process and kind of how, you know, how things have, have rolled out with, with COVID and kind of where we where we stand. And so I believe, Zach, you have um, the floor now for your um, presentation. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Zach Trammell. Um, just to provide a visual description, I am a uh, late 20s, older, uh, late 20s uh, white male with freckles, uh, reddish brown hair, a red beard, I'm wearing brown glasses today and a navy blue shirt. Um, and I'm gonna be sharing with you um, my screen here shortly. And, okay. all right, so you should be seeing the uh, US Aging logo. Um, it's uh, purple and blue, the US is in purple and the word aging is in blue with a um, line going across the top of a the aging representing the forward uh, motion of the aging network as we strive to meet the ever-changing needs of older adults in our community. Um, also on the slide is the uh, Administration for Communities Living logo, uh, which features three people, one in red, one in blue, and one in yellow. The Elder Care Locator logo, which is a uh, eight-pointed star uh, made of circles that radiate outwards. And the Dial logo, um, or the Disability Information and Access Line logo, which is uh, yellow, blue, and red also. And as I said, my name is Zach Trammell. I'm the program manager at US Aging for both the Elder Care Locator and the Disability Information Access Line. If you have questions um, afterwards, we don't get to them. My email address is uh, Z Trammell, my last name, which is T-R-A-M-M-E-L at usaging.org. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you have. Um, I'd be happy to chat with you after um, today's webinar if you would like. So we'll start um, just a little bit, giving you an overview of uh, both our call centers and talking a little bit about um, trends that we've seen um, with COVID-19. Um, we'll start with the elder care locator. Um, sorry, having a little trouble here. Uh, we'll start with the elder care locator. Um, the Elder Care Locator has been a public service that's been going strong for nearly 30 years now. Uh, both of our call centers at U.S. Aging are funded by the Administration for Community Living um, and administered by us here at U.S. Aging. So I just want to share a high-level overview of how people connect with um, the Elder Care Locator and their experience. Um, a person from anywhere in the United States or the US territories can call or connect through our website via chat and email. Um, once they're connected, our, one of our trained specialists will listen to the caller's concerns, ask some questions, and assist the individual by connecting them to their local state and um, local or state aging and disability organizations or an appropriate national resource. Uh, most of the time, people are referred to the elder care locator by some national agency or organization. Um, like Social Security, Medicare, or AARP, to name a few. Other times, they connect with us via internet through a Google search, or um, we're also featured on the Social Security um, COLA letter that goes out every year toward the end of December, 1st of January. So um, on the slide, it just demonstrates uh, the flow in which people get connected to us. So from the top left-hand corner, there's a telephone icon um, showing that callers can connect with us from anywhere in the United States. It then features the Elder Care Locator logo. And finally, um, three logos representing the United States as a map, a um, federal style building representing state government, and then a uh, office building with windows representing the local organizations. So we generally receive over 400,000 calls contacts per year, which breaks down to about 26 to 36,000 uh, contacts per month 
from every state, the District of Columbia, and all of the U.S. territories. Our call center is based in Washington, D.C., and again, can be contacted via phone, email, or live to chat, uh, which is accessible through our website, eldercare.acl.gov. Our current hours of operation are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. However, callers can receive assistance after hours through our voice prompt system, which allows people to connect directly to the local agencies, even if the elder care locator, um, even if an elder care locator specialist is not available. Um, and on the slide, it just shows the annual contacts that I just spoke about and the hours of operation, um, which again are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the person who most likely is to contact the elder care locator um, is a female over the age of 60 and is looking for services for themselves. Uh, we know that 73% of our callers identify as female, 92% of them are over the age of 60, and 62% of them are calling about themselves. Um, about 12% of our callers identify as the daughter of someone, um, an older adult, in their lives that they're calling looking for services for. Um, so just wanted to share that just to give a little bit of context about who is frequently reaching out to the elder care locator. Um, so on the screen right now, there's a pie chart that reflects our last 12 months of call documentation um, to show the most frequent inquiries to the elder care locator. Over the last 12 months, we fielded an increased number of calls regarding supportive services like transportation and in-home assistance as people have acclimated to the new normal. Um, if you work with older adults and caregivers, this list probably sounds really familiar to you. Um, so at about 10% of our total call volume, transportation is the most frequent inquiry we receive. Um, we did see, you know, during the early days of the pandemic in 2020, a steep decline in the number of transportation requests. Um, as everything shut down, older adults were encouraged to stay home and stay safe. Um, but as more older, adult, older adults have um, received vaccines, as things have reopened, we have seen a steady increase in requests for transportation, mostly to routine medical appointments. So in this last 12 month period, um, we've received 32,616 requests for transportation. Um, questions about in-home services, such as assistance with cooking, showering, grocery shopping, and home-delivered meals make up the next group of most frequent calls. Um, we've filled in about 17,000 of those calls um, during the last 12 months. A new trend that's emerged with the pandemic is um, an increase in housing inquiries. Um, housing has become our third most frequent uh, request of the elder care locator. And that request has been, again, just increasing since 2020. Uh, we know as a country we're facing an affordable housing crisis, and each day we are building more and more calls from older adults saying that they're being priced out of their current living situation. Um, other frequent call types um, included are people seeking assistance with their social security benefits, um, people exploring long-term care options, legal services, uh, where to turn for help when a situation involves abuse, neglect, or exploitation, caregiver resources, and of course, COVID-19. Um, in the last six months, the primary request related to COVID-19 has been around testing options, including uh, free test kits. Our specialists have been proactively offering the free test kits and helping um, older adults and caregivers place orders through the USPS system to receive those test kits. So every single caller, um, regardless if they called about COVID-19, has been offered COVID-19 information about the vaccine, the boosters, and uh, the test kits, and now the uh, accessible test kits. So not everyone wants or needs to call um, or live chat with an elder care locator specialist. Our call center is designed to assist members of the public who are seeking resources and are needing a starting point. But by going to our website, which again is eldercare.acl.gov, people can access our comprehensive database on their own and get connected to the same local aging and disability resources that we provide via phone. This is often the preferred method for professionals seeking quick contact information 
for caregivers who are internet savvy um, and are looking for services maybe outside of the area that they work in or live in. So the most frequently used aspect of our website is the agency lookup feature. Um, this, this slide shows uh, a snapshot of our website. Um, at the very top, there is a teal banner uh, that has the a search bar to enter your zip code in. Um, you can, if you want to, you can test it out. Oh, sorry about that, folks. I keep advancing the slides uh, prematurely, but anyways, you can test it out right now. If you'd like, you can go to eldercare.acl.gov. You will, should hopefully, if you get to the right place, um, see the, the teal bar and the picture of the three older ladies um, right beneath that. Um, once there, you can type in your zip code and hit search, and it should provide you with a list of options in your local area. Um, if for some reason you're a professional on uh, the webinar today and you do this and you notice there's an error on your agency's listing, please reach out to me. We can get those updated usually within um, one business day. So if you're on the website and you ever notice an error, please reach out. We, we try very hard to keep that information up to date. We do routine, routine updates, but sometimes things slip by us. So um, just throwing that out there for any professionals on the call today. But again, the website is eldercare.acl.gov. Um, there are nine options, potential options for the elder care locator database listing. So you could potentially receive up to nine different types of resources. Um, the first one is information and referral and assistance programs. These are typically run by area agencies on aging. Um, other options include Aging and Disability Resource Centers, or ADRCs, Area Agencies on Aging, Title VI Native American Programs, the State Unit on Aging, Elder Abuse Prevention Resources, Health Insurance Counseling, Legal Service Programs, and Long-Term Care Ombudsman. A lot of people want to know um, if their uh, organization or um, group can be added to the Elder Care Locator Database. All of these nine programs receive funding either directly or indirectly through ACL. So ACL supports um, these, nine these nine types of organizations, and that is why they're featured on our website. However, if you do have a resource that you think would be really helpful for our specialists to know about, we are constantly adding things to our internal database. We just don't publish them on the website. And that's the value of connecting with one of our elder care locator specialists. Um, every year, uh, the Elder Care Locator publishes um, our Home for the Holiday um, campaign. Uh, it's the focus of the campaign is to really start um, a difficult conversation um, with caregivers and family members, um, oftentimes around the holidays. And so each year we pick a relevant topic um, for caregivers to discuss. The last two years have been focused on pandemic um, issues. So this previous this current um, Home for the Holidays brochure is on helping aid, healthy aging in a pandemic world, what older adults and caregivers need to know about. Uh, the cover of the brochure is featured on this slide. The brochure has a blue background with yellow type that says healthy aging in a pandemic world. And then the subtitle is in white, what older adults and caregivers need to know. And it features images of um, older adults engaging in supportive um, services. Um, it's target, the target audience, oh, sorry, keep doing that. I'm really struggling today. Um, the target audience for our Home for the Holidays, again, is really older adults and caregivers who are maybe re-engaging with one another after a really restrictive time. And so, again, it just provides a lot of really helpful information um, for older adults and caregivers to have that conversation. Um, for organizations who are interested in this material, we produce a toolkit of resources to help you utilize this material, be able to promote it through your website, through your social media channels, through newsletter articles. Um, our brochures are also available to order. So if you want one for yourself to share with someone in your life, then um, we can certainly send you that free of charge. If you're an organization looking to place a bulk order, we um, charge a small fee just to help cover shipping costs, but these are available to order. And again, if you want to order those, please connect with me. I'm happy to help you 
um, get those for your organization as well. Um, here are some examples of uh, past Home for the Holiday topics. So there's three brochures pictured on the screen. Um, the most previous one um, was staying connected and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, again, it was focused on how caregivers can support people safely um, during the pandemic. Uh, the other one was Caring Across the Miles, which um, was not published during the pandemic, but very relevant for um, people who, again, are long distance caregivers. I think a lot of people became long distance caregivers during the pandemic, even if they lived down the street from their loved one, um, just because of safety concerns. And then the other one is Living Well with Dementia in the Community. Um, so again, all of these are available. Um, if any of them interest you, um, you can again visit our website or connect with me directly. Um, and we'd be happy to get those out to you. We also have PDFs um, on the website that you can pull directly um, and print as needed or share as needed. Um, so those are available. Um, if you have any questions about that, again, please connect with me, I'm happy to help. Um, I just wanted to close the, the elder care locator portion by sharing our contact information. So our phone number is on the screen. Um, you can connect with a specialist again, Monday through Friday. 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time by calling 1-800-677-1116. You can also email us anytime at eldercarelocator at usaging.org. The live chat feature is available through the website, eldercare.acl.gov. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, though we don't provide any resources or services through those two social media platforms, but you can follow along to stay um, up to date on what's happening um, in, in the two centers. So I want to shift over now and share a little bit about our newest uh, call center dial or the Disability Information Access Line. Um, again, this is an ACL funded call center that US Aging has used three decades of call center experience to launch and administer in partnership with several national disability organizations to assist older adults and people with disabilities in accessing vaccines back in March of 2021. President Biden announced an additional $100 million had been allocated to the CDC to support the efforts of the aging and disability networks in assisting with vaccination process. As part of this unprecedented um, amount of money, a partnership was formed between CDC and ACL with US aging receiving supplemental funding from ACL to both increase the capacity of the elder care locator and develop this new call center focused on vaccine access for people with disabilities. Um, as I shared, we worked with uh, seven key um, leaders in the disability community uh, to really develop this call center and to understand the unique elements of the disability culture and the needs um, and how to take those needs into consideration as we completed a very quick, and I'm talking like three weeks, um, set up of a new call center and prepared to um, do the promotion. So these partners um, were very instrumental in the naming of the center, the training of our newly hired specialists, developing quick references and scripts, advising on where to refer people to so that we were sending people to the right place, helping us maintain a database of resources and doing all sorts of promotion. So um, the list of, list of partners and this again, we've partnered with so many other organizations, including APH um, as well, but the list of core partners that have really um, been vital to dial success is the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living, April, the Association of University Centers on Disability, AUCD, uh, the Independent Living Research Utilization, um, ILRU, the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, um, NACDD, and the National Council on Independent Living, NICL, the National Disability Rights Network, NDRN, and uh, finally, the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategies. Um, so again, just some of our dial partners, other people have come along as well. The National Federation of the Blind has been really helpful um, in helping us understand the need for accessible COVID testing and how to, how to work with individuals who are blind or low vision. Alan has uh, been great. He's done a training with our team on um, that as well and the APH Connect Center. So a lot of really wonderful people have, have really stepped up and helped us in a space where, um, you know, we, 
we didn't have a whole lot of experience prior to uh, May of 2021 and launching um, the Disability Information Access Line. Um, so since launching in May of 2021, we've handled about 50,000 calls. Um, we average about 815 calls per week. During the busy month of December to March, uh, DIAL was featured as part of the Social Security COLA letter. We were taking about um, 1,000 to 2,000 calls per week. A lot of those were benefits-based questions, but Again, our specialist was working proactively to ask and engage people in the conversation about what they needed um, to access either the COVID vaccine or COVID testing. Um, so, you know, it's been uh, really nice to see that. And we've maintained a, a pretty steady call average, like I said, 815 calls per week um, since this post-social security season. So who is contacting Vial? Um, of the callers who provided this information, you don't have to provide information at either of our call centers to receive services, but of the callers who provided information to us, 84% are seeking services or supports for themselves. 65% um, were 60 years or older, and 60% reported having a physical disability. Um, 19% reported a chronic health condition, 11% reported mental, emotional, or behavioral health concerns, 5% reported blindness or low vision impairment, and 2% reported deafness or hard of hearing. So we're working on collecting more demographic information um, in our next reporting period, including gender, race, ethnicity, to really understand um, you know, who we're reaching and to be able to do some more target out, targeted outreach to maybe more marginalized communities. Um, also in an effort to field more calls from the deaf community and younger people with disabilities, we recently added two uh, new access options. So we added live chat, uh, which can be accessed through acl.gov forward slash dial, as well as a direct connect um, ASL video capability. So anyone using a video phone who needs that service can connect um, with someone who actually signs now um, versus using a relay service. So we're very excited about that. Um, so again, some just reasons that people have contacted DIAL. The most frequent reasons related to uh, COVID-19 have been seeking in-home or on-site vaccination options, um, assistance with the COVID-19 vaccine appointment setting up, uh, information about booster shots and testing, which has really dominated the conversation um, in the last three to four months, I would say, uh, with you know not only USPS sending out free test kits, but then also the Loom test kit coming about um, and being um, made available. We do know, though, from our callers that there have been challenges with the Loom test kit. Um, you know, it does require if you've used it, if you haven't, it requires a smartphone capability. Um, so it is a, it's a more accessible option, and so we've been helping people order those test kits. We've also been building questions about how do I use this, and or this doesn't work for me. I still am having trouble. What are my options? And helping people get connected to community testing options. Other reasons that people have called DIAL outside of COVID um, just are related to benefits, housing options, in-home support services, health insurance questions, financial assistance, and nutrition services, just to name a few. So again, our focus really, while we started was, has been COVID vaccination, um, COVID testing access, but we've fielded so many other requests and questions from um, people. So our dial specialists are most likely to refer a person um, to their local center for independent living, if they're over 60, their local area agency on aging, um, their local ADRC or their DD council, depending on um, what the request is, what they're looking for. Um, other referrals include state and local health departments, vaccines.gov, we get a lot of information from the CDC um, as our partner, covidtest.gov, helping people order test kits on the phone, and then state COVID hotlines, even though we're starting to see some of those close and shift as the pandemic has shifted. Um, but those are just some of the referrals. We, as I alluded to, we've been doing a lot of promotion activities. Um, so we've done a dial marketing work group where we had people uh, from the disability community, of all disabilities come together and help us develop and understand how to 
reach the disability community. Um, we've done map releases out through various um, radio stations and newspapers. We've done um, a social media toolkit, which is available on our website for anyone who would like that and would like to uh, share dial on any of the social media platforms. We have a postcard and uh, flyer, which I'll show on the next slide, an infographic, and then radio um, and video PSAs. We're working on getting in more to the uh, social media space, um, hopefully going forward, as well as doing some wider targeted marketing to communities around the country. Um, so on this slide, it just shows the cover of our social media toolkit, uh, which features two African-American males. Um, one is younger, the one's slightly older, and he's uh, looks like he's holding his hand. It also shows uh, two graphics that could be used on social media platforms. One says, thanks to Dial, I got my COVID vaccine, and shows a uh, red-headed young lady wearing glasses and a mask pointing to a Band-Aid on her right arm. Um, the other one is um, an image that says, we've missed our favorite activities during the pandemic. Let's get vaccinated and get back together. Uh, showing two friends, one of which is in a wheelchair taking a selfie. And again, those are available and ready to use for anyone who wants to share them on their social media platforms. Um, those are available and if you need help accessing those, please let me know. I'd be happy to send them to you or point you and where you can find them. Um, this slide shows the postcard that um, is going out to uh, communities around the country. Um, just talks a little bit about the services that Dial provides as the various ways that people can connect with the Disability Information Access Line and features um, a young man in a wheelchair uh, and his mom helping him with his cell phone. Um, so again, what can you do to spread the word um, about Dial? Um, those promotional materials are available. Um, we also are on Twitter and Facebook as well, so you can find us there. Um, Here's the dial contact information. Um, so our number, our dial number is 1-888-677-111-1199. Um, you can also email dial at usagingandisability.org um, as well as visit acl.gov forward slash dial. And thank you all for being here and listening to me. I think I went over a little bit, but um, hopefully a lot of information to share. And um, again, if you have any questions, hopefully we can take those at the end, but you can also connect with me via email. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me now? I think I'm good. Um, thank you, Zach, for that um, presentation. Um, we do, um, we will, if, if people do have um, questions, feel free to put those in the chat. It should be working now for everyone. Apologies if it wasn't earlier, um, but that should be working. Um, I next want to turn to um, Valerie for, um, to start talking a little bit about, you know, Zach mentioned some of the partnerships and advocacy efforts. Um, so um, we'll turn it over to Valerie, um, representing the National Federation of the Blind, and then to um, Dan Spoon, representing the American Council of the Blind. So Valerie. Great, thanks, Katie. Um, I'll just start by saying the NFB has been a, a fierce advocate for accessible at-home COVID-19 test kits, and this has led to some really important partnerships. Um, our advocacy efforts uh, have, have brought us to collaboration with various federal agencies. Most importantly now um, our, is our current work with the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics, uh, or RADx program at NIH. NFB is a contracted expert with RADx and individual members of the NFB are also contracted experts providing feedback on the accessibility of COVID tests and instructions and also providing guidance on what best practices for at-home test development should be. We continue to work with the Administration for Community Living on improving blind Americans' access to usable COVID-19 tests. This summer, we helped evaluate and uh, assisted with the launch of the first at-home test distribution effort targeting um, targeted specifically to blind Americans. Zach referenced this. 
And because the distribution effort was so successful to the point of there being only a limited amount of accessible tests remaining for distribution, we're now offering our guidance to ACL on how they can better communicate to blind Americans where, how, and when they can receive these accessible at-home COVID-19 tests. Um, other partners have included the test manufacturers themselves. Earlier this year, before our work with Radix, NFB took steps to independently purchase and um, assess all tests that were being distributed by the federal government and other commercially available COVID-19 tests. Not surprisingly, the vast majority of these tests were completely inaccessible. Uh, only two COVID-19 tests, uh, Illum and Q Health, um, offered accessibility features to the point of being usable by blind Americans. NFB reached out to these test companies to offer our review feedback and, and also our partnership in making these tests even more accessible. And we continue to be in contact with Illum and Q. Um, I, I do want to take a moment just to talk about how, how we got to this point. Um, NF, um, NFB, let's see, well, uh, the, the lack of non-visual access to COVID-19 information, vaccines, and testing has, has been a critical problem since 2020. Um, in 2021, when the focus shifted to home testing as a critical method for stopping the spread of COVID-19, um, and when the President of the United States announced government support for free at-home tests, we recognized the need for action and the opportunity for change. Um, and at that point, we reached out to um, a number of different government agencies, um, some of whom I've already mentioned. Um, we also reached out to uh, the FDA, uh, Acting Director of NIH, Principal Deputy Administrator of ACL, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and all of the publicly identifiable entities that have received government contracts in the program. Um, stressing the importance of accessible tests, we we chose a collaborative approach um, because, because we knew that this offered a historic opportunity to change the way that tests are developed. Um, we could have been more, more aggressive, um, but we, we wanted to first um, work collaboratively and create change um, in, in partnership. Um, we amplified the work we were doing on social media cha channels and among our partners. Um, and, oh, in addition to our outreach and, and our letters, we, um, we knew that blind Americans urgently needed access to the at-home COVID-19 tests, and we put our own resources into making sure that blind Americans had the best information possible at our own expense. We quickly put all government testing information on our NFB Newsline resource, um, along with other COVID-19 resources we had curated. We purchased and evaluated the majority of the tests being distributed, as I mentioned, uh, and we contracted with IRA to offer free on-demand visual interpreting for our members um, who needed to take one of the inaccessible at-home COVID tests. So our, our outreach was effective. We started having regular meetings with key White House officials um, who both acknowledged that blind people had been left out of the process, but who also sought our guidance on how best to remediate the situation. And I'll, I'll stress that the White House's first public statement from um, regarding non-visual access was the one released to um, during the NFB's Great Gathering in, in February. Um, on a more local level, we provided guidance to our state level affiliates and a template letter that our members could use to advocate to their local county state or health department or whatever agency was distributing at home COVID-19 tests so that they too could demand equal access and accessible tests. Um, and since then, um, NF, uh, let's see, Jill Heemskirk, Deputy Director of NIH's National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering presented during this year's NFB National Convention. Jill spoke about the multi-pronged approach that Radix and NIH are taking, um, the less I ideal prong being to modify existing tests so that they are usable by blind Americans, and then the more favorable, uh, favorable approach being the long-term goal of creating a framework for accessibility that can be used to develop future at-home tests. Um, so I, with, with that, Katie, I don't know if you want to shift um, presenters. 
Sure. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that um, overview of, of advocacy initiatives. And um, Dan, I know that you as um, president of the American Council of the Blind, as another um, consumer organization, have also played an active role in this process. Would you speak to that for us, please? Sure. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Valerie. Uh, I first want to say, you know, this is an effort that has, you know, gone across all the different uh, consumer groups for the blind and, and low vision community. And so, uh, you know, the American Council of Blind, the National Federation of the Blind, uh, Mark and myself and uh, Eric and John and Neil and Clark, we all get together once a quarter to kind of talk about you know, pending uh, issues, legislative imperatives, things that are really impacting our community, and try to find areas where can we where we can work collaboratively. And this is one of those areas where we've kind of uh, worked uh, together uh, to, I would say, apply the most amount of pressure as we can to those who can make a change uh, related to accessible home test kits and our community. And I think we've been very successful in those efforts. Uh, the American Council of Blind was able to reach out to Dr. Bruce Thromberg, through, who was the director of the NIBIB organization, the institute inside of the National Institutes of Health that was responsible for the RADx program that Valerie spoke of earlier. Uh, we really encouraged uh, that we reached out and formed listening sessions because we always felt it's better uh, for or the folks that are developing the solution to hear from those that are impacted by it. Uh, and so uh, we had many representatives uh, in our first listening session that included not only members uh, and representatives from the blind and low vision community, but also those organizations that were dealing with fine motor skill um, disabilities, as well as the aging uh, community. And so it was interesting uh, to see as they took us through those exercises to hear what were the areas that were causing the lack of accessibility for the existing test kits across all three of those communities. And what we found, as Valerie alluded to a little bit, is that there are some common themes there of being able to understand the instructions in a very easy and usable fashion. Uh, to be able to identify the different components that make up the test kit. Are they properly labeled, identified, do they have the right tactile markings to be able to be easily recognized if you are blind or have low vision? Um, then can you actually execute the test? And so uh, what we've all learned as we've gone through this process is there's really three different levels uh, that we're kind of trying to work through to come up with the ultimate solution. The first level is really more the immediate three to six month level where you see the tests like the Illum test that again, do not work for all the members of our community, but only for the ability uh, to use uh, you know, smartphones and, 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 and devices able to access the Illum test kit. So you have to have Bluetooth capability. It's not for everybody, but it is for a portion of our community a potential solution. So we're working first for that kind of, you know, um, real quick, immediate fix. And then the second level is in that intermediate level where you're actually changing the packaging. You're changing the uh, making the materials more tactile to be able to be used by our community. Those require changes from the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA. And so those are longer lead time that will take probably more like 12 months or longer in order to implement. But as Valerie kind of alluded to, where we really believe the collaboration is making a difference is in the true long-term solution, whereas um, the whole industry for medical testing expands, we believe there'll be more and more home testing that's taken part as a place as our normal medical regimen expands. And what we are really looking at for the Holy Grail is to have all of those tests 
uh, accessible. And there, I think, we are really changing attitudes uh, inside the different federal agencies and the National Institute of Health to say, this is not a wish, this is a right for all blind and low vision uh, Americans. And how do we make uh, the solutions available with accessibility on the front end, not on the back end? And so we've gotten um, you know, feedback and assurances from Dr. Thromberg that that is the direction that NIBIB is headed. And so I think that uh, Valerie may have some more comments on that, but I think that's the really exciting part of all this is short-term solving the issues for the COVID-19 test, but long-term really providing an inclusive solution for our community for all home tests, uh, I think, is, is, is where we want to be in the long run. Thank you so much, Dan, for that, that perspective and that, that overview. Um, Valerie, do you have any anything to add add to that, or uh, just just a, a small point? Thank you uh, so much, Dan, for summarizing that so effectively. Um, it, it, illustratively, um, we know that the work we're doing will affect change in the at home testing industry for countless other types of tests, and this can include pregnancy tests and glucose tests, genetic tests, tests for infectious diseases, and and many others. Um, the best practices being developed right now through Radix um, and the work with the testing companies and design firms is creating this important framework that will move us forward. Um, as Dan mentioned, future tests will include tactile elements, QR codes, alternate format instructions, non-visually accessible results. And um, we're really optimistic. We're really eager about these critical changes. Um, we, we know we'll be a part of the process moving forward. Um, we also acknowledge that, that we have a lot to learn. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. Yeah, Valerie, this is Dan. I want to just add one more thing. We've also been working with the communications uh, arm inside of the Radex team to really kind of look at how can we provide an accessible survey out there for our community so again, we can get feedback from the end users that are actually using this te these tests uh, so we can really learn from that experience because so many times uh, what will happen is those uh, that, are, that are doing the research and the development on the front end need to really understand the perspective of how well it's following through to the end users on the back end. So again, I think where our consumer groups are having a huge impact is really making sure that as these tests get developed, it is really uh, not about us without us, and we are all getting included in the solution. Thank you, Dan, and you provided kind of a natural segue. I want to now turn to my colleague who I work with in the Connect Center, Alan Lovell, who works on our, on our information and referral line um, to talk a little bit about his personal experience with, with COVID tests. Um, we did put a blog up on Vision Aware, which I put a link to in the chat discussing the landscape of, of COVID tests, but um, offered um, Alan here a few minutes to, to share some of his experiences as, as a blind user um, who's taken some COVID tests. So with that, Alan, I turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Katie. Right up front, I apologize. Our lawn service has taken this opportunity to come, <laughs> so I expect my dog is going to bark right through this presentation. I'm going to try to be quick. Um, so uh, the reason, um, as Katie mentioned, we actually recorded some footage and she wrote a blog post on all of this accessibility of COVID tests, which is up on Vision Aware, um, is to have that um, unboxing as a blind person experience. You know, how how can we make these tests accessible? We started with uh, just a run of the mill mainstream COVID test using our assistive technology to see if it could be done without anyone in the room with us. Um, and as as our panelists mentioned before, um, the accessibility part comes through assistive technology. Um, unfortunately, without it, it uh, my, my fast conclusion is that these uh, tests, whether it be mainstream or the accessible version, accessible version could not be done. Um, and so not to take away from 
what is accessible with the use of assistive technology, that's fantastic. But, uh, you know, again, the experience for someone who may be new to being low vision or blind uh, won't be the same. Um, their experience won't be the same because they have likely not learned assistive technology yet. So that's where we need help. Um, so the recordings that we made were sort of unboxing. Um, we did the mainstream test, which the long and the short of that is we ended up using a service such as Ira or Be My Eyes. These are apps that we can download onto our smartphones, which puts a human, <clears throat> a sighted human at the other end of our camera who can um, access our camera, take pictures of what they are seeing, enlarge them or search the web uh, and actually guide us, see us and guide us through um, a, a, a home test. So our first run uh, of this was a mainstream, non-accessible run-of-the-mill test I got at Walgreens. And um, we were able to complete a test with the use of an IRA agent. Uh, now, the Illum test that is um, available through USPS, um, you can search for USPS Illum Home Test. That um, is one that once I have done once, I was able to do several more times uh, on my own. The first time was, again, an unboxing experience, and it took quite a while to work through and find all the various components that I needed to be able to complete the test. Uh, that was one uh, finding the instructions on which app to download. Um, and I'm just looking at my notes here so that I get the name right, um, because I did wind up downloading the incorrect app at first. So um, you have to actually search for a Loom E L L U M E COVID 19 home test. Uh, and that will bring up the correct app through the App Store or Google Play Store. Um, after downloading the app, upon, upon first launch, you'll have to do some housekeeping like uh, allowing access to your, your Bluetooth um, and sharing information. Uh, you have to register with personal information. Uh, right off the bat, I was uh, sort of taken aback because, you know, a person without disabilities can take a home test without sharing personal information. So even though this app asks you to fill out your name, address, phone number, email, and all of that, it is possible to put in the wrong information. You are not legally required to put this information into the app if you don't want to. Um, okay, so once you set up the app, um, it is a matter of navigating the app, which is using um, the Illum home test. Uh, the reason that you have an app is that there is a device they call the analyzer. This is where your specimen or your sample uh, goes. It is a battery powered device. No worries, it's already, you know, it's electronic. You don't have to insert batteries or anything. But this device has to be paired up via Bluetooth to your smartphone. Um, and um, so when we go through the app itself, we run into accessibility issues um, with the areas where you're filling in name, address, phone number. Um, there are some text fields that are improperly labeled that causes some confusion on what information goes where. Um, a seasoned smartphone user will get there eventually. And um, you know, like I said, it took me several tries. The first unboxing took all morning. Uh, subsequent times where I've had to take the test because I was, I did end up positive with COVID. I was able to run through it in just a matter of a few minutes. So after you've done it once, um, it's it's good to have in the bank that information, that knowledge on how to do it. Um, there again. Um, after you fill out your information that uh, you sort of have to stumble through with the improperly labeled edit boxes, text boxes, you have to accept the terms of service, which um, for those of us who use smartphones and have to do this a lot, you expect a checkbox. It's actually labeled a checkbox. On this app, it is an X. It just says X. It does not indicate that you are to check there or not, but through a process of elimination, you just have to double tap the um, X to accept the terms of services. Uh, next, you have to run 
through the instructions. There is actually an instructional video that guides you through. Um, you cannot access the video without keying in your personal information first and accepting the terms, um, and that is a little misleading too. Um, also, the analyzer that I just mentioned has to connect to your phone via Bluetooth. The instructions mention holding down a button and a blue light flashing or green light flashing. <laughs> we um, That doesn't help us much, does it? But fortunately, uh, your, your smartphone will indicate if you follow the instructions um, by pressing and holding down the button for a period of time, your phone will vocalize that it is connected or not connected. Uh, then you can watch the video, then you can read the instructions line by line after the video, which is even more helpful. Um, you know, once you get to that part of it, it's you're you're pretty good. But again, the accessibility comes from being a um, smartphone user. So with our partnership with um, the Elder Care Locator Service and others who can reach us directly, we are here to prove provide um, guidance in a more personal type setting if someone wanted to contact me or my counterpart Sharon Huey here in the APH Connect Center. Um, you can call 800-232-5463 and either of us are able to walk someone through the unboxing process. We've run out of time. I have a um, kit here that I had planned on opening and going through the various components. We're not going to have time for that today, no. but if you were a caller, um, I would be able to go through and help you identify what components are what. Um, so just that's our role in all this. Thank you, Alan. And we do have those videos on our website that I mentioned as well. So um, we do have um, one person, um, Danielle, if you wish to speak, Danielle Foster. So Danielle, you just need to unmute. All right, we are not getting um, Danielle to um, unmute, so um, apologies. If you're able to put a question into the chat, I see there's yeah, a couple of hands raised too. I don't know how you can access them. Here. Yeah, let's see. Um, we have a hand raised on the panel. Can you go ahead and you can unmute uh, panelists and go ahead and speak, please? Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay, great. This is Anil Lewis with the National Federation of the Blind. Really quickly, I just wanted to make a point. When Valerie was explaining that we did an evaluation of about a dozen COVID tests before the um, relationship got really, well, not lucrative, helpful, collaborative, that's the word I was looking for. We, we noticed that two tests were native, natively fairly accessible. The Loom test and the Q Health test were independently operable by blind individuals. And the point I wanted to really highlight is that these companies didn't make their tests with accessibility in mind. Right. So the reason that I point that out is because I always like to tell people accessibility is not harder. It just needs to be intentional. And that's why I'm really glad that we're able to work with um, the companies out of NIH, uh, et cetera, not only just for increased accessibility of the existing COVID tests, but as was mentioned by both Valerie and Dan, the positive implication on everything moving forward. Once accessibility is in the framework of what they're considering, everything's going to be great. It's going to be much better. And then the last piece I'll offer is I learned at the uh, the ADA celebration at the, the vice president's residence, I think Senator Harkin says, the mantra has changed from nothing about us without us to nothing without us, which I love because I, I recognize that people with disabilities have value to offer in everything. It's not just about you know meeting our specific needs because the biggest messaging around all of this, and we've had this conversation with Jill Hinksert is, the, the products being made accessible or non-visually accessible to us are just better products for everybody. The multimodal yes. feedback and engagement that we offer, just making it accessible to us, also benefits sighted people. So I think that that's important for us to continue to message because then they won't say, well, how many people is this really going to affect? Well, everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that great Good point. point. And Thank we, you. we are at time. We do need to end. I'm going to pause the recording and 
I just want to say thank you again to our captioner, to our panelists, to attendees for coming today and for making this webinar such a great success. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.